Good afternoon. My name is Dwayne Manasas. Um, I'm the founder and managing director of Polar Research and Policy Initiative, a London-based think tank uh, focusing on Arctic, Nordic, North Atlantic, North Pacific and Antarctic issues. I'd like to welcome you all to this session on bridging Arctic islands. Um, I'd like to say good afternoon because I'm based here in London. I'm not entirely sure where all of you are based, but we'd love to know that. So if you don't mind telling us what you, where, where you consider home, where are you right now? We'd love to have feedback about where you're tuning in from. And you can see the poll right there. Do, do feel free to let us know. And also do feel free to introduce yourselves. Papua New Guinea, I see, excellent, welcome. So we do, we have people coming in from Australia, from the Caribbean. Well, on that note, may I, wonderful, so we've got quite a few in Europe and, and quite a few in the Caribbean and North America. Well, welcome all. On this note, may I just say, um, can we start with, um, think about the concept as a whole, bridging Arctic islands. If you think about the Arctic, the three ways to look at this, the Arctic as a region of islands, if you look at the north, from the north of Alaska through Canada in particular, the Canadian north is uh, very islanded. And then you look at, you know, Greenland, Iceland, the Faroes, Orkney and Shetland to the north of Scotland. You look at islands like Tromsø or Jan Mayen or Svalbard in Norway. And then you go off to the Russian Arctic and again, a great number of islands there. So the Arctic is very much not just an ocean surrounded by land, but it is also a region of islands. There's another way to look at it. It's Arctic communities being islanded communities. There are a great number of similarities between remote communities across the Arctic and island communities across around the world, uh, whether in terms of geographic location, in terms of challenges they face, or opportunities they have, and this is something we will discuss in this session. And finally, a third way to look at the topic is how do we draw the link between the Arctic and island states around the world, either small island states in the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific, or even larger islands like Greenland and Australia, or Iceland and New Zealand, which do share similarities and challenges. So again, a number of ways in which we can draw the link between the Arctic and islands. And I do hope you find the session useful as we bring, bring you five excellent speakers. On that note, may I just start with the introductions to our speakers. The first one is James Stockin, who is the leader for Orkney Islands Council. James, can I ask you to uh, make a little presentation for us about your perspectives from Orkney? Indeed, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Dwayne, and welcome from Orkney. Or I'm just going to see if I can get up my uh, PowerPoint to share here for you, which I don't know whether it's coming on because of the, because what else is coming on the screen? Right, just give me a moment and I'll get the slideshow on. I don't know if you can see that, but it doesn't seem to be coming as it should be. Can you see that? Yes, we can see we can we can see the presentation, James. So do Sorry, it's just the fact that it's not coming fully on my screen as it was do doing earlier on. So I'll just run it as it is because. Uh, for those that you don't know, Orkney is a group of 60 islands off the north coast of Scotland in the UK. Uh, I would call Orkney a near Arctic place rather than an Arctic place because we're kind of in that transition between the European perspective and the Arctic perspective. But as you can see from my slide, there's been people here for more than 6,000 years. Our archaeology goes way back beyond the time of the building of the pyramids. And there was civilization here who weren't just stuck in the one place, but they were always a moving, traveling population. And through the whole of that 6,000 years history, 
people used Orkney as a stepping stone to go both north and south. The, 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 the Viking and the Norse kingdom used Orkney as the stepping stone to go north from here to Shetland, to the Faroes, onto a, a Iceland and Greenland and right round to what they called Vinland all these years ago. And even then in the time of the kind of British Empire, the, the north of Can Canada was explored by Franklin and Ray, who stopped here. In fact, a, a Captain Cook, as we know him, he was one of the first to go from these islands and, and discover the north. And then during the last World War, when Scapa Flow was used as the center of the strategic place in the north of the North Sea for protection, there were convoys went here over to Russia onto the east. So Orkney's always had that uniquely place of being the crossroads and being in that space where it was just right strategically placed. But our islands are interested now to see where we can actually do some of this bridging of the Arctic because the maps we look at often are looking in a Mercator projection eh, and often based kind of from Europe or, or, or a populated place looking north. But I'll just show you, this is often the way I look at the world. It's maybe inverted compared with other people, but you can see that we in Orkney are in the center of something that's further north. And I, I refer to us as the gateway to the Arctic in the West. And we are very much in a space of looking to the future, seeing what can be found from the past and projected into the future to make lives, people's lives better, to make people's aid, to actually, we would like to serve the North from this place. And so we're particularly interested in many issues that affect islands because globally islands have very much the similar issues. We, we struggle with waste and with energy. We struggle with our demographics, most islands, and we struggle in some respects with connectivity, both digital and I suppose physical. And the transport element is something that we're interested to know how we can serve the North. And if I show you this next slide, it shows of these Arctic routes that are opening up across the world for shipping. And I'll just concentrate on that for a few, mo few moments, because as the Northwest and particularly the Northeast Passage opens up, our strate strategic position eh, has been something that's played a part in the past. So we're interested to see how it can play a part in the future. And our offering of Scapa Flow, which is the world's second largest harbour, it's the biggest natural harbour in, in the Northern Hemisphere. We're asking, should it be used again to facilitate these routes so that the islands in the north can actually come to a central point for, the, for, for their goods to be, to take each of these places closer to market than they'd been before. And at the same time, allow us to open up as the ice melts, new, new traffic routes and so we really believe that Scarpa Flow has got a real opportunity here to do something. And one of the reflections that we have on that is it's not just because we know that these routes are there for cargo, it's already happened for us with regards to the cruise market. And all our islands in the north are now being connected by the tourist trade. And we're interested how that can build out into other lines. So Orkney has the biggest number of, of, uh, of ships that visit us anywhere in the UK. We're the biggest port call because people from the circumnavigate in the UK come here. People who are going from you know, the Germanys onto the Arctic usually stop in Orkney on their way when they're on their way to the Faroes or Iceland or when they're coming the other way across the Atlantic they come and stop in Orkney as they're going across eh, to Norway, you know, to the ports that are there, particularly to Bergen or even further north. And so we know that there's these connections beginning and we're saying, how do we make sure that they're secured and how do we work with our best geography 
to make sure that everybody gets some of the best trading routes they can, because we know that also has another effect, because that helps us with regards to where we are with the use of energy. Trading routes in the past, when people use sail, they used the most effective route. And we would like people to come back looking to the most effective routes. So finally, one of Orkney's great themes, which I can't not mention, is our pioneering place in the energy thing, in the energy market. We now have 120% of our electricity been coming from renewables, but we're look, looking into many other storage and uh, different vectors of energy. And that is, would help us enormously with these new connectivities and transport. We're looking at, at the hydrogen opportunity for, for ships, and we're looking to be that proper place where everybody can benefit from. So that's just a little flavor. I know I don't have long and there's many other speakers, and really, to be honest, I'd like to speak about many other island aspects, but I think I'll leave you with that today. James, it was utterly fascinating. Um, I had the great opportunity to visit Scapaflo with you and Inga uh, a few months ago, and um, the opportunities arising with the depth of the harbour, with the size of the harbour, with the sheltered location, is absolutely interesting and, and worth a deeper conversation later in. Later on, may I now call upon Inga, who um, works with Highland and Islands Enterprise as University Engagement Manager there, a fascinating body that again focuses on regional development in the region. But I will let Inga um, explain more about what the organisation does and also uh, let us know more about how islands fit in. Inga, over Thank to you very much, Dwayne. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay, yes, Dwayne? Okay. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and I'm hoping you can see some slides there as well. Some nods are reassuring, so that's great. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and uh, good to, to hear from you, James, as well. Um, I'm glad just to have made it and linked in, to be quite honest. So it's been a bit of a, a frantic morning trying to work out everything. But um, in amongst the gales that are, that are here at the moment, um, I'm also based in Orkney, but I, I work with Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Um, and I'm going to give you a, a bit of an overview as to my kind of involvement within the Arctic side of things. Um, within my role as, as University Engagement Manager. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of a background to um, the, the organisation itself um, and um, a little bit of an overview as to, as to the role and those synergies and challenges um, with regards to university engagement particularly um, that have been forthcoming over the, over the last um, couple of years certainly. So um, Highlands and Islands Enterprise um, itself is is a is a economic development agency, really an enterprise agency for the north and, and west of, of Scotland. Um, it is basically there um, to support that economic development, reaching to support the mostly SMEs, so your small medium enterprises, which largely are around um, less than 50 individuals within the, the companies that they support. Um, it is also quite unique in terms of what it supports in terms of the, the community development and the strengthening communities. Um, and that is a key angle um, with regards to how it goes about its, its business and support for the region as a whole. Um, there are a number of offices and teams within the organisation and there are regional teams, there are also local area teams that provide support for specific areas. Um, and that provides support for businesses and community groups and, and development trusts um, to enable um, growth um, and support for various activities that are relevant um, to the local areas, but also on a regional, national and international level as well. Um, so in terms of the location, um, there's the, the map there that kind of sets the scene in terms of that global perspective. Um, as you can see from the location, it's a, it's a, it's a large um, part of the geography of, of Scotland specifically. Um, it has around 100 inhabited islands that that covers, a um, population of just under um, half a million. Um, mention has been made to um, the demographics of a number of these areas. Um, so we have around 
around 45% of the population are, are over 50, um, and there's around 12 um, people per kilometre squared, compared to around an average of 70 in, in Scotland. Um, the furthest north group of islands are the Shetland Islands, just below that. The, and so those are the sort of turquoise islands on, on the top of the map, and just below that is, is Orkney, and then we've got the, the north coast of the mainland of Scotland and towards um, the left hand side we'll see if you're looking at the map <laughs> or the west and um, then um, we have the western isles and further south argyll and, and the islands as well so you can see um the sort of region of islands as you described doing earlier and um, with regards to the arctic is very much present in the region of the highlands and islands as well um, in terms of the latitude that that, um, that shetland is at our most northerly group of islands we have um, basically at 60 degrees north, so on the same level as um, Anchorage, Alaska and St. Petersburg. So um, certainly um, comparable in terms of that near Arctic region. And looking out the window today, it's pretty Arctic looking here. <laughs> so, um, so certainly there, there's a lot of synergies there. Um, it's the region as a whole compared to the UK, it's certainly the most, most sparsely populated um, and one of the challenges we have is around um, population decline in, in those areas, um, particularly within the 15 to 19 years of age, um, with many of these individuals moving away from the region um, to study at, at university. Um, and that's where my role comes in within the university's education and skills team to look at opportunities to grow university activity that will support um, opportunities for economic development in its own right through more opportunities for studying academia and um, research even professional service staff all supports economic development and the sustainable development of, of the regions as a whole before even looking at the impact from the research and activity that goes on through through the universities themselves so just um, moving on, over the last couple of years, there's been um, a, an increase in, in that sort of focus around Arctic engagement. Um, this stemmed from an Arctic Circle Forum session that was hosted by the Scottish Government in Edinburgh in November 2017. Um, and um, at that session, there was an announcement that uh, the Scottish which was launched in Orkney um, just a couple of weeks ago on the 23rd of se September. Um, so this is you know, the first um, framework that, that allows us to begin to explore and look at you know, building on many of the links that already exist. And I think that's one of the things that's, that's really come to the fore over the last couple of years is, is actually this isn't you know, about necessarily new connections. It, it's you know, especially in, in the northern part of Scotland, the, the connections are very, very real. Um, and um, between the communities that, that, have, that are based there and, and the generations before for. Um, and I think that's been um, really quite eye-opening um, to a number of us that's, that's been involved. Um, so that opportunity to really reconnect is, um, is really quite interesting and quite exciting. Um, so the Arctic Forum session was the first of those sessions within Scotland um, and that's led on to a number of engagements to date and I think the two things that came from that session for me were certainly the strength of community um, and the role um, of, of that community activity um, within um, that Arctic engagement or the connections between remote rural island communities um, but also the role of universities and the existing level of engagement between academics, um, whether they're based within subarctic, sort of near Arctic countries or across the world. Um, and that was something that really came to the fore. So, so for myself, in terms of my role within Highlands and Islands Enterprise, I'm looking to attract, to grow, encourage more university related activities. Communities that were in similar situations um, and had similar challenges um, was something that you know was really quite exciting um, and opening up, up new conversations. And that's something that we are looking to develop even further as we move through the sort of um, engagement activity. So in terms of our region and, and our islands um, at, within the Highlands and Islands of Scotland, we have the University of the Highlands and Islands, which is a distributed university. 
Um, and, and that has grown up. It's a young university and has locations across our islands, all three island groups, as well as the rest of the region. Um, and that's a tertiary institution that provides opportunities for higher education within schools, right through to PhD opportunities that are largely related to the place and the people and the environment within which it's based. So it could be around um, agronomy and northern um, barley, perhaps um, suited for northern climates it could be around archaeology and um, nordic and northern studies and um, looking also to do with tourism and tourism studies there where they have been involved in a number of projects around sustainability and um, and slow adventure tourism so a vast number of um, research and activity that's very related to um, the various Arctic and Northern communities um, that, that we're in, engaged. Um, so in terms of the, the University of the Highlands and Islands, there's some strategic links with, with Arctic to date, um, particularly through the marine sector um, and the University of the Arctic, where it has um, been a, one of the founding members of that organisation. And indeed, the model of the University of the Highlands and Islands has been something that has informed the development of the University of the Arctic in itself as well. So stretching back, there's been many engagements that you know many of us probably weren't actually aware of the extent to which we've had relationships to date. So one of the particular areas is obviously around that marine economy. Um, obviously, our islands um, and coastal areas are, are you know, key in terms of our, our region, particularly. Um, and many of these, we talk about islands, but some of these locations in our region can be as remote and rural as any of the islands. Um, so um, get into some of these areas, it's sometimes easier to get to our islands than, than it is to, to get to some of these um, more landlocked areas. Um, and again, that synergies that we have with some of the, the Arctic regions as well. Um, so I think um, one of the areas here is, is really around um, the, the challenges around getting um, increases in university activity and innovation within our area. Um, so uh, the way I look at it, we have a, a support and, and mechanism support in, in those areas and innovation and businesses um, that often universities are remote from their place and their central um, place as well. So there's an element of understanding the challenges around research in remote places, around supporting that and enabling collaboration and communication and engagement with communities and businesses, which as we all know within island and remote areas, more than often requires a different approach or a tweak here and there or additional investment just to make things happen um, and um, these kind of things are, are always there to to overcome and to find new innovative ways and approaches um, to, to deal with these and I think this is one of the things that's coming through the engagement with more northerly communities is that we share so many challenges and can see so many opportunities and the barriers that are there are often the same ones so actually coming together and connecting more around these areas collaboratively um, is, is something we would hope can unlock some of the challenges that, that we all face as well. Um, and I think one of the things um, I can refer specifically to Orkney within this is, you know, the, the island group here has a vast amount of innovation um, going on there. We have three universities currently that have a footprint within, um, within Orkney. Um, and much of that has been around the energy innovation and activity that's come through that. Um, and the, the Heriot Watt University in particular has had a small cohort of students that have continually fed um, the emergence of the renewable energy in this industry within Orkney. And that has been critical and essential to enabling attraction of people and um, that talent um, going through into that industry. So although it's small numbers, the value of that for emerging economies in, in these areas and, and island communities, you really can't underestimate how important and that is um, to support and, and take forward. Um, so I think that effort into um, engagement, effort into clustering, effort into collaboration is be underestimated. The value that comes from creating trusting relationships um, is, is essential and, um, and really, really important within these communities. 
Um, just finally, a, a, a slide here that, that highlights, we, we refer a lot to this sort of triple helix uh, with regards to innovation um, and involving academia, government, sort of business, and more so the concept of the quadruple helix, which really fundamentally associates the community and involves society within that kind of process. And I think what we find in more of our remote and island areas is this this values that are embedded within our place and within our communities. And, and this looks at the connection with environment and the importance of community led approaches. And we can see that in many of our island communities um, across the, the highlands and islands um, that, that really have a, a, a sort of proactive approach to some of the challenges that, that have, they have come up against in, in many of the areas. So this quintuple helix approach of having a foundation of environment to the natural resources and valuing those with a community-led approach that enables you know the challenges to be set for academia government business to, to actually respond to I think is something that's increasingly important to, to value in, in that moving forward um, there's an element there as well with regards to university engagement around respecting that knowledge and, and understanding the, the level of intellectual capital that exists within many of our communities. Um, and I think that's something, again, with the renewables industry, we've, we've sort of understood that, that the knowledge of the environment and our marine environment, particularly to enable development and innovation within our seas um, has been you know, particularly important. So, and I think that's something having come into this Arctic kind of conversation and understanding you know, more around the, the Arctic communities, that storytelling approach and the knowledge that's held within you know, the individual communities and, and individuals within in these communities and the value associated with that um, you know to understand that and really you know be able to give something back and recognize that I think is really important within that university engagement sort of approach um, and I've always been looking at trying to find ways to actually capture some of that engagement and I think this slide I, I, I found this um, sort of summary of um, in a report that was done around Orkney and the ways to um, sort of the principles around culture, cultural values and I felt it was really quite fitting from an Orkney perspective but I imagine it's probably quite fitting across a number of island and, and remote rural sort of communities um, and that's looking at clear visions, flexible confidence, the value of Exists, and that open democratic governance as, as well as that sustainability in terms of that economic model. So I'm speeded through that um, and I, that's the end of, of what I'm going to do. It's probably way over seven minutes, but um, hopefully that gives you a bit of a regional perspective from the Highlands and Islands of Scotland and um, identifies some of the more island specific aspects and the, the value of um, the university activity and that educational component um, to support sustainable development and, and engagement uh, um, across the regions and islands. Well, thank you very much for that, Inga. That was highly informative. <laughs> You're despite, welcome. Despite having interacted with UHI and HIE on several occasions, I, I feel I've just had a uh, crash course in all the wonderful things you do. So thank you very much. Um, having started with two exciting presentations about Orkney, a part of the UK, part of Scotland, very near Arctic as a, as a part of the wider region. Let's move over now to... Uh, to what we would regard as sort of the Arctic that's above the Arctic Circle. So on that note, or rather just around the Arctic Circle. So first, let us bring in, let's make a way northwest of it. Let's start with a Scottish neighbour from the Faroe Islands, Martin Moore Olson, Project Manager of the Innovation Unit at the University of the Faroe Islands. Obviously, the Faroes have been great, have a great record in innovation, whether in transport, infrastructure, connectivity, broadband. We'd love to know more, Martin, so over to you. There we go. Um, am I, am I on the screen or I can't tell? Or is it, okay, good, 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 sorry. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm a project manager at the university here in the Faroe Islands. Uh, just really quick, uh, we're a really small university compared to uh, 
other universities in the Arctic, uh, around 600 students. Um, the Faroe Islands are in this, 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 this changing period right now where uh, we're on our way to sort of becoming the new Iceland uh, with, in terms of uh, tourism. Tourism is really booming. Uh, the, the Faroe East GDP is uh, the highest growing uh, in uh, the Nordic countries at the moment. And so we're in this sort of really strange period. We just have uh, a new, we have a new rector at the university. He's, uh, he's from Scotland. So the university is also, also in this, this sort of changing process of, of internationalizing and reaching out more than, more so than it, uh, it has. So I'm just gonna find my presentation here really quick. I'm, I wanna give you a really quick overview of, um, of the Faroe Islands and in terms of uh, connections and, and, and bridges and boundaries. So the Faroe Islands are, are extremely small, as you probably know, and uh, but we we are really, really connected to the outside world. Um, we have uh, around 50,000 people. We have twice that uh, in terms of tourists annually, and uh, our airport is like 400, 500,000 uh, visitors a year. So the majority of the Faroe Islands, uh, the Faroe Islanders have uh, lived abroad, studied abroad, worked abroad, or are like me, I am, I'm, uh, I'm working abroad as well. And most of us speak Faroese, Danish, Swedish, Norwegian, English. So we're connected in that sense as well. And we're, it's also a very diverse uh, society. We have about a hundred nationalities uh, here um, and, uh, and it's, it's growing uh, steadily. So just as a, uh, an illustration of how connected we are, these are the uh, arrivals and departures at the airport today. So there are nine arrivals and nine departures. So in two hours time, I could, I could be in Edinburgh um, from, from my home, or I could go to Paris, you know. So geographically, we're extremely connected. And when it comes to, as uh, Dwayne touched on as well, uh, the uh, internet, penetration in the Faroe Islands is near 100%. It's, it's some of the fastest internet in the region and uh, the most um, uh, stable internet in the world. So we're also going to be the first, um, uh, one of the first countries to roll out 5G. And uh, our Faroe East Telecoms is looking into uh, Orkney and Shetland uh, to see if uh, they can roll out uh, there. So Technologically, uh, financially, um, you know, in terms of travel, we're extremely uh, connected. So the Faroe Islands are a very modern country in that sense, a modern Nordic country, uh, like Iceland or, or Norway in that sense. Uh, and it's become this sort of hipster place as well, which is really, really uh, interesting. Um, but in terms of uh, the Arctic, we're not really that connected. Um, so this, this, political <clears throat> sort of construct of this, 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 the modern sort of way of looking at the Arctic that's the rage now is, is fairly new to the Faroe Islands or Faroe Islanders because we're, we're used to being part of these uh, constellations uh, of groups of small countries, so especially the Nordic countries, we uh, were part of that. We're part of the uh, subsection of the Nordic countries called the Nora region. We're also historically a part of the, the Kingdom of Denmark and we're also uh, within this academic field, we're part of the West Nordic region, which is Greenland and Iceland and the Faroe Islands. And then we're seeing this uh, new movement from, especially from Scotland. Uh, I don't know if you can call it a post-Brexit Scotland or what's going to happen there, but we're, we're, we're having a lot of meetings, a lot of talks with uh, Scotland uh, in general. And there's, there's a lot of, uh, as James was talking about, there are a lot of historical ties and, you know, people, uh, you know, Shetland and the Faroe Islands are nearly identical if you uh, if you go visit. So uh, this uh, the the policy paper on on your right here is um, is a couple years old now, but it was the first strategy from the Far the government of the Faroe Islands to sort of take part in the Arctic. And if you if you look at the illustration there, you can see how it's sort of uh, the borders are sort of, sort of jerry rigged to sort of fit the Faroe Islands, <laughs> um, but in a, in a more sort of practical sense, uh, in, a, in, a, in an academic setting, uh, the Faroe Islands 
are not very active within the Arctic um, at, at the moment. So in order to sort of combat that, we, uh, we established um, an innovation unit, which started as a, <clears throat> as a way for the university to sort of consolidate and to formalize uh, networks and, and uh, collaborations within the Arctic and, and beyond. So I'm a part of that um, um, unit. So we, 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 we started working on how do we, how do we engage with the Arctic? How do we, how do we uh, meet people? How do we work on projects? So we're, we've been working on this really, uh, it, it can, I, I'll show you, it can seem a bit complicated. It's, it's sort of a framework for engagement uh, that takes a lead from science diplomacy uh, in a sense. And I'll show it to you real quick. It, it's it's part of a, a chapter I'm writing um, right now. So if you look at the uh, horizontal axes here, um, whenever we have a new project, uh, and let's say in the Arctic, um, we'll we'll try to ground it within the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and we'll try to see how many of those we can uh, we can address. And then we look at internal operations, and it, <clears throat> uh, does the project uh, relate itself to education and research and, and stuff like that. And then we, we, uh, we compare it to the mission statements that we, um, uh, the university has, so education research and, and dissemination. And then we're working on this fourth uh, mission statement um, called the co-creation for sustainability, uh, where we sort of try to look at solving local issues for, uh, in a practical sense, not so much in a theoretical uh, sense. And we try to sort of bring in st uh, stakeholders similar to what Ingo is talking about with uh, the Helix models, we're, we're trying to see how far we can uh, go with uh, triple Helix, quadruple Helix, and, and quintuple Helix. And once we have these um, uh, stakeholders uh, in, a, in one place, we, we, we try to start a collaborative process that hopefully will, the output will be economic, uh, environmental, and social uh, sustainability. So in short, that's, that's, that's what we're sort of working with. Uh, but um, a lot of these meetings, a lot of these projects, they come from joining uh, assemblies like the Arctic Circle Assembly, the Arctic Frontiers and so on, just meeting people, not necessarily academics, but just civil society, NGOs and, and that kind of stuff. So on the, the image to your right here, you can see four different universities. Uh, this is the University of um, uh, for the Faroe Islands, University of Greenland, Technical University of Denmark, and then you have the College of the Atlantic here. We're all working on a project on uh, educating Arctic entrepreneurs. And we're, this is a project that we just completed and uh, we, we use the sustainable development goals as a common language. So whenever we, we, we started something, uh, um, uh, a workshop or something, we had students or staff pick out sustainable development goals that they wanted to work with uh, in order to find sort of a common language uh, around sustainable development. And, and the whole project was based on teaching sustainable innovation, sustainable entrepreneurship. And we, we used, and we tried to, uh, to use uh, real case scenarios in a theoretical sense. So in this case, the students were not uh, producing anything tangible, it was more a uh, theoretical um, exercise. Uh, but that has led us, the success of, of that project has led us to uh, a really big project that we're working on with um, the University of Greenland, Univers uh, University of Akureyri, um, I think it's uh, MIT, the Faroe Islands, uh, Denmark, where we're gonna we're gonna bring them to Greenland. Uh, we're gonna have a week long boot camp, and then we're gonna have a two week voyage down the coast of uh, Greenland, and then we're gonna stop at every port and uh, have them talk to uh, to uh, you know citizens at in these different towns, and the whole point is to have them uh, break up in groups. And instead of solving theoretical problems, we want them to solve real, real issues in the Arctic. And as they make their way down the coast of Greenland, they're going to have um, a coaching and classes and and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And um, 
it's it's again grounded in the sustainable development. They have to pick one or more sustainable development goal to uh, to work from. We're uh, going to be using the abundance cycle framework, which is Jay Friedlander's uh, framework from uh, uh, the College of the Atlantic. And then we're going to use these uh, these open innovation, social innovation, and, and technical innovation uh, tactics to engage with civil society, government, and so on. And uh, then when we get to uh, the Southern Greenland, uh, we're they, the students will have to uh, present their project to a panel and we're going to pick a winner and they're going to receive a cash prize. And then once they return home, uh, local incubators are going to take over to uh, manage the projects uh, onward. So in general, academia, as, as we heard Inga talk about, academia has a, a really vital role to play in building bridges and, and spanning these, these boundaries. Uh, and we need, we need staff and students that are able to span boundaries not you know try to look beyond their their daily activities so if you're a social scientist you can you can be a social scientist with a, a sustainability slant for example and we found that just talking about the sustainable development goals in general it's so easy it's, it's just a universal language by this point and again as Inga was talking about helix uh, collaboration that's really core to what we're doing. And um, yeah, everyone's interested. If you talk about sustainable development, it's, it's, it's such a, an easy uh, discussion to have. Um, and then just try to congregate with uh, peers, especially if your university is really small. We have maybe two anthropologists at our university. Uh, it might be hard for them to, uh, to find peer groups. So, you know, Congregate where your peers are, and, and uh, uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, meet um, stakeholders that are not within your peer group as well. Or you can do is uh, you can just lock these people up in a boat for a month and then just <laughs> force them to work together, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's one example of, of what we're doing uh, in the Faroe Islands. So going from this hyper-connected uh, country, a modern country, and we're trying to sort of utilize uh, those options in, in, a, in a practical, proactive sense. So, um, so yeah. Oh, my arrow has disappeared. Oh, no. no. Martin, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, that, was, that was very useful. Um, I do remember, Martin, last year when we were the Arctic Circle Pharaohs, um, I, was, I was absolutely impressed when we were going through one of these tunnels and I could still access, um, I could still access internet, my mobile data, at a very good speed. It was very yeah. impressive. I think people take it for granted how connected islands associated with remoteness can be. I think Ferris yeah. has a lot to teach the world and, and also sit here in the UK about it. So thank you for your presentation as well. You also mentioned about the North Atlantic. And I think one, one thing we tend to do, those of us who work in the Arctic space, is we look at the world map, the way it's been handed down to us with the North Atlantic in the middle. And so our imagination, the way we imagine the Arctic, the way we engage with the Arctic, the way we uh, study the Arctic has a, unfortunately, a, a privileging of the North Atlantic. And mm. while the North Atlantic is very important, if you only turn the map around a little bit, if you turn the globe around, the North Pacific is equally important. And that would be mm -hmm. a slightly different picture where you have Alaska right in the middle of the North, North Pacific Arctic. And of course, you know, the Eastern bits of Russia and Korea and Japan all of a sudden become more relevant. You got the Pacific Northwest across the US and Canada, cross-border region, again, rising in significance. So as we move now from the North Atlantic to the North Pacific, uh, we're delighted to have uh, a speaker joining us from, I mean, from Alaska. Um, so, Alice, may I bring you in now? Alice is the, uh, the owner, the publisher, the editorial director of Arctic Today. If you don't know about Arctic Today, I'd highly recommend you look it up. It's, a, it's the world's only Southern Polar News outlet bringing in news from across the region. Um, a great place, you know, subscribe there. Great place to get good Arctic news. Alice, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Dwayne. I've been really struck by listening to my fellow speakers because 
the reality is counterintuitive as between the North Pacific and the North Atlantic. I suspect that most of you listening or, or my other speaker uh, panelists would assume that because Alaska is part of the US, that all of the sustainable development plans and goals and infrastructure required for them exist in abundance in the US. Uh, sadly, in most parts of the islands of Alaska in the Bering Sea, uh, it's the opposite. And it's something that's very hard for many of my fellow Alaskan, certainly the, the political leaders, to want to face up to. But um, I'll come to the, to the reasons for this in a moment, but, but let's just say that with the example Dwayne just gave of driving through a tunnel in the Faroes, I drove through the same tunnel and had the same reaction. It was 4G all the way. It was beautiful connectivity. When I go to islands in Alaska, I am lucky to get what is basically dial-up speed plus a little bit on a cellular telephone that can't roam or connect to any place else in the world. And as for uh, satellite Wi-Fi, there is such problematic connectivity that you couldn't even have many participants there taking place as speakers on a panel like this because there wouldn't be enough signal strength to get through a sentence for them. And this is the United States. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the reasons that it's complicated in Alaska, of course, is that just as in the Canadian Arctic, there's an overlay of indigenous people's rights and land ownership and political power that is uneven from place to place. But uh, as, a, as a general rule, it complicates the role that the state government in Alaska or the federal government in Canada can play in directly uh, changing the conditions in those communities, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. It's just simply a different playing field politically. But what that means in the Bering Sea Islands of Alaska is that there's a predominant point of view in the communities that they should be allowed to stay thriving communities for subsistence hunting and fishing which would therefore frown on much in the way of tourist infrastructure to the extent that might get in the way of harvesting the natural resources. But on the other hand, it also means that there is no basis of an economy locally with which to drive for a conversion from what is still nearly 100% diesel power with a little bit of wind sprinkled in in contrast to what you in Orkney have, which is 120% renewable energy. So when you, when you take the whole picture and you stand back and you look at the circumpolar Arctic region, it reminds me of something that uh, the, the wonderful Alaskan Senator said a few years ago, and that is that there isn't one Arctic, there are three Arctics. And of course you can, do, you can fine tune it much more than that. But there's the Nordic and North Atlantic Arctic, which is highly developed. And then there's Russia, which is not developed at all, except militarily. And then there's the US, Alaska, and Canada, which are, I would argue, closer to Russia than to the Nordic countries in terms of the infrastructure that's required to build new economies. So I've probably shocked some of the people listening to, to hear this from the United States, the first world, but in, in the Arctic, I don't think we are the first world. Um, and, and as for the notion of the special significance of islands, the islands in the Bering Sea as one final point, and then I'll stop, these islands are very, very low lying. The Bering Land Bridge, recall, was um, 
a, a walkable surface area some 10,000 years ago, which we believe explains the migration of people from Siberia to North America. Well, as a result, the land masses that are in the Bering Sea today have an elevation of, in some cases, five feet, in some cases, 15 to 20 feet. But there are really no mountainous or even Im impressively rock-based places. And so they are going to be, to the extent they're not already, as threatened by rising sea level as New Guinea and the Seychelles and Tahiti and so forth. And that also, I think, makes them very different places from the North Atlantic speakers you've just been hearing from, who due to the accident of geography and topography happen to live on islands with very high rock masses. So I'll pause there and let you all pick up the conversation and hope that gives you some good food for thought. Thank you very much, Alice. That, that was really insightful. Um, let me pick up on one point you mentioned. You, you brought up in your final remarks about the, you mentioned the small island communities in the Bering Sea. And I'm particularly interested in the communities in the islands along the coast as well, near Nome, and particularly Kivalina, uh, New Talk, Shishmaref, uh, communities that um, are some of the first places in North America or perhaps the world to experience climate induced community relocations, which has, of course, become a really important topic in this space. But this brings me to a second related topic which is what do communities do? How do governments react? What role do societies have when there are disasters, when, when, when calamities happen? And how do, how do communities respond? How do governments respond? And again, there are sort of formal and informal frameworks of disaster response or disaster uh, mitigation. Um, disaster reduction. So on that note, I'm actually really pleased that our next speaker is an expert on disaster risk reduction. So can I call upon Patricia uh, to, to highlight not only sort of start off with these brief examples I mentioned of Shishma Ref, but also to really talk about the areas you really study, which I guess is Svalbard and, and the Caribbean. So over to you, Patricia. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dwayne. And I apologize in advance, uh, in advance for um, a little bit of sniffling here and there. I'm a little bit sick right now, so apologies for that. Um, I'll just pull up my presentation for you one second. Can you see it? Can you see, hello? Yes, we can, Patricia. Okay, wonderful. So, okay, fantastic. So, um, again, thank you so much for the invitation to uh, be a speaker at this conference. And really, so far, I've been so impressed by um, the previous sessions, and I'm really happy to be part of this uh, amazing event, really. And um, yeah, so in the next few minutes, what I would like to do is to share, as Dwayne already outlined, um, my research on disasters, um, which I have been conducting on Svalbard and Dominica in the Caribbean. Um, and I would like to go through a few connections between the two, which I think are rather interesting and also speak to the importance of the role of communication, shared learning, um, well, and really other support between islands and by extension also the importance of, of this very summit. So um, now to some maybe the thought of a comparison between the two might seem odd, right? Um, considering that at first glance they seem well as different as islands can get from each other really. Um, <clears throat> one second. There you go. Um, so Svalbard of course um, <laughs> as you all know is an Arctic archipelago and um, one of the most uh, northernmost permanently inhabited settlements in the world. Um, they claim to be very often the most northern um, settlement, but I think there's an exception of uh, a small settlement in, in Canada, I believe called Al uh, Alert. So, well, not the northernmost, but uh, almost. Um, and for those who, who know Svalbard, we, we um, 
well, would associate it with a rather good infrastructure, you know, the topic that was already mentioned here, internet and so on. Um, infrastructure, perhaps not between the two settlements that comprise Svalbard, but um, in the settlements for sure, in terms of um, tourism, in terms of also health uh, infrastructure and so on. And of course, living in, uh, in, in such a place does require high investments in, in infrastructure. And um, Svalbard, with its two main settlements, um, has about two, two and a half thousand um, people living there, um, one in Longyear Bay, in their Norwegian, but also very international settlement. And then we have Barentsburg, um, which I believe has around 300 people and is a predominantly Russian settlement, which again, politically speaks to somewhat um, complex governance. Um, the island is governed by Norway through the 1920s Spitsbergen Treaty. Um, but as I said, with those two distinct settlements, um, it, it causes some uh, well, complexities. And um, yeah, and as I said, it's um, rather perhaps odd comparing those islands, if you, it's, you know, even starting from the very basics, you can see there's not much in terms of, um, well, how would you say that, trees and so on. Whereas if we go to Dominica, um, a Caribbean island, it's a, a tropical island known for its beaches and um, would be, I'm sorry, would be very, very different from um, Svalbard on many um, parameters. So for anybody who's been to Dominica, people will know that um, the street infrastructure is not exactly great. Um, same, I would say, for the hill health infrastructure. And as opposed to Svalbard, I would also say that um, Dominica is a rather um, poor country. Um, I believe the GDP of Dominica is something around seven and a half thousand US dollar per capita. And Svalbard, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, should be around 55,000 US dollars per capita. So quite, quite the gap. And of course, Dominica is an independent um, country or an independent, independent developing uh, island state. And um, so quite, quite different islands, right? But if we take um, a disaster governance perspective, um, I would like to argue that they are much more similar than we might think at first glance. And we don't have much time here, so, in the, in the remaining time, I would like to focus on three major points or three points that I think well, are perhaps the most important to me. So the first one, and perhaps obvious to some, but uh, when I speak to people, it does not seem obvious at all, um, is that both islands are very susceptible to a wide range of disasters. So not as we perhaps are used from some places that you, know, you might count, you, you might have to take into, into consideration one, two, three risks, disaster risks or disasters that you know, may happen, but it's a whole gamut. Um, so in Svalbard's case, of course, um, we have um, avalanches, we have landslides, floods, earthquakes. There's now talk of volcanoes that have been discovered, um, storm surge. We have had airplane crashes on Svalbard. And of course, other potentially disastrous, disastrous accidents, especially if we consider the increasing tourism industry on Svalbard. Um, and then, of course, um, there's also the risk of power failures to consider, which in a remote Arctic place may quickly deteriorate to a disaster. In fact, um, in Svalbard's case, a power failure in, of just more than a few hours would require the entire island to be evacuated. And that, of course, is very different to um, Dominica, but what is not different um, is that that in terms of range of disasters, we have a very wide range, like in, in Svalbard, and some of the disaster risks are actually, are actually quite similar. Um, so Dominica, at the moment, is still recovering from Hurricane Maria, which I believe damaged something like 85% of the island's um, houses. Um, so there people face many of the same risks minus of course the snow avalanches but you know you can add the uh, risk of volcanic eruptions instead which people um, are very very aware of and also very aware of that they have not had any recent experience in dealing with it um, 
and also tourism. So similarly to Svalbard, tourism does, um, well, it's maybe not a disaster in itself, but does drive disaster um, risks if it is not connected to sustainable development. Um, so that would be the first point. And the second point in terms of similarities between the two is that um, in, the, in, in, in my research that I have that I've done, sorry, this was, this was actually a presentation or a picture of the um, avalanche that happened in 2017 in Svalbard. And I'll talk a little, about that a little bit more later. Um, so in terms of, um, in terms of um, the second point, the, dis the dissatisfaction of formal disaster governance, that is something that's very common to both islands, really. Um, and that might not come as a surprise to some in the case of Dominica, when you consider that, uh, when you consider some of the classic stereotypical governance challenges of a developing country. So of course you have, as we said, the lack of proper general infrastructure and let alone specialized one um, like search and rescue um, infrastructure. And with respect to disaster aid, what I've seen especially was political favoritism, you deal with petty corruption, and that's just really to name a few. Yet, what I think is perhaps surprising, um, that something very similar was the case for Svalbard, which hardly can, can be said to be facing the same challenges, right? Um, and anybody who knows Svalbard, or even Norway for that matter, um, and particularly the northern part that serves Svalbard in the case of emergency, knows of the um, almost legendary status enjoyed by its highly skilled and really well-equipped search and rescue forests and disaster governance capacity. Um, and yet in my interviews after, you know, having heard initially that positive reaction, nearly every interview in my research revealed after some time that on Svalbard too, there is distrust in the capacity of formal disaster mechanisms. And I believe one of the crucial um, events that led to it was really the uh, Svalbard avalanche in, um, well, or the, Long Bain, the, Long, the avalanche in Longyearbyen in 2017, when the formal mechanisms did not exactly suffice and were really overwhelmed by, um, by the avalanche that involved people from rescuing, that involved people, or res rescuing people from under um, houses as opposed to in the field, which is something that they were experienced um, with, and rescuing people from under houses, they were not. And um, I'm sorry, one moment. So events such as this gave pe people the feeling that when push comes to shove, they may very well be on their own. So um, in this case, especially, um, people had to really come onto the streets and people were called upon to come and help saving people. And um, this is only compounded by the fact that when Svalbard's capacities are overwhelmed, so no matter if it's by avalanches, accidents, or perhaps even disease outbreaks, help generally is very far away. And if the weather deteriorates, they may not come at all, right? Because you can't exactly fly in from, from the mainland in such an event. So what's really interesting is that this perception was also corroborated during my interviews with former authorities. And to put it in the words of um, a search and rescue authority on Svalbard, when referring also a little bit to climate change's impact on the island's disaster potential, um, he said to me that, basically something along the lines of here on Svalbard, we see that what we know today and prepare for may be irrelevant or outdated tomorrow, we can hardly keep up. And that may seem perhaps a little bit of an exaggeration um, and perhaps more of his personal perception rather than reality, but it does clearly convey the issues associated with um, populations that are over-relying on formal disaster governance mechanisms, as well as the need for well more awareness research and input um into what i'm researching um the 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 element of informal disaster governance and um from leading directly from that informal disaster governance my third and final point is that um partially by virtue of the small size of the islands or in spybot case 
disasters um, in those two places can very quickly become or feel like existential crises um, that, well, yeah, affect the, the, entire, the entire island and de facto overwhelm um, formal disaster governance mechanisms and require international cross-border interventions. So in terms of form, formal disaster governance, we're all familiar with the result, right? Um, appeals for assistance, which may be government to government, maybe government to NGO, um, and so on. And, but also the informal disaster um, governance or disaster response um, does cross, cross borders. So for example, in Dominica, um, people did reach out to family and friends abroad, very often experts, but also via social media, people that they did not know whatsoever. And in one case that I know personally, a private person did reach out to an international NGO who as a result did come to Dominica and has been leading a lot of the disaster relief uh, since. Um, and add to the whole mix that the general mistrust of formal institution that I mentioned later, it, it just amplifies the importance of focusing on the international side of disaster governance and small islands. So for small islands, facing a multitude of disaster risks, existential threats even maybe, um, fostering strong bonds, both formally and informally, could be perhaps more Im important than we actually thought up until now. And yes, to end, um, I'd like to share that um, this international aspect of disasters has led my colleagues and I to initiate a disaster diplomacy research project that explores how disasters can be used to foster peaceful links between Norway and Russia. Um, so that's particularly important to Svalbard, of course. And I believe this might be interesting for the audience here today. And one of my colleagues or the project lead really on this project is Professor Ilan Kellman. And I believe he's also one of the attendees today. So feel free to ask any questions um, about that project if you're interested. And yes, that's how I'd like to finish. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Patricia. That's that was excellent, right from um, disaster governance mechanisms, formal and informal, right down to disaster diplomacy. So thank you. Um, I'm now going to move on to questions, make, you know, bearing in mind that we have about 23 minutes to go in the session. So can I, if you are an attendee, do feel free to use the Q&A facility to fire any questions you may have to our speakers. And I'm going to do my best to get through as many of them. Um, Let's start with the question by Mimi Scheller. Um, now this particular question says, could, could someone, one of the speakers, Inga Martin, anyone here, comment on how universities could develop more interdisciplinary training of students to transcend the boundaries of specialization? And whether this would be valuable for connecting islands and bridging areas, such as in sustainability, energy, innovation, ecology. Um, of course, our, our attendee is thinking about the human ecology model used for the College of the Atlantic as one example. But may I also, this is Dwayne speaking, not Mimi, just come in here to say, um, Inga, on that point, just building on education, um, the University of the Highland and Islands model may have a lot to contribute to the challenges we're now having in, say, the Northwest Territories in Canada where you have remote communities spread across very vast, sparsely populated land areas. And the idea is how do we provide tertiary education in a way that um, communities, remote communities can actually benefit from them. Now, I also understand University of the West Indies may have already um, bridged a lot of these gaps. So again, there's an enormous amount of scope for cooperation between UHI, College of the Atlantic, University of the West Indies, and current movements in the Yukon and Northwest Territories in Canada and Nunavut. So can I, can I, can I direct this question to Inga first? And 
Hi, Dwayne. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I think um, one of the things, obviously, that inter that that so dispersed model is is the first step. You know, having people in these specific locations um, that can then engage and respond to the needs. So, and and I think that place based approach, understanding what the needs in terms of the 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 economies within those areas, what what the needs of those are, are really important, and ensuring that that two way engagement. And, and communication is in place between the institutions and, and academia, et cetera, that, that are based there and the communities and the businesses that, that are part of that as well. And I think one of the things that can often get missed is that knowledge kind of intermediary that, that, that goes between the community and between the, the, um, the institution itself. So enabling the universities so that they have the capacity to engage is, is something as well as that intermediary to enable communities to engage effectively and come up with those solutions and, and opportunities that, that meet the needs of both because they can be coming at things from different perspectives. There's demands on, on universities to respond and deliver papers and, and and, and meet requirements of internationalization. There's also requirements from a community perspective, and sometimes these can differ. So it's about understanding the place and having the capacity to engage and uh, effectively within those communities that I think is, is really, really important. Um, would you like me to respond to Mimi's um, question at the same time or? Yes, please, let me okay. know. <laughs> um, so in terms of the interdisciplinary training, we've mentioned sustainable development quite a number of times um, throughout these presentations, and I'm sure it's cropping up in many of the other presentations as well and, and sessions. And I think one of the things that I have found with regards to engaging um, from the academic side is looking at, you know, taking people from those core disciplines and bringing them together around that concept of sustainable development. So they begin to come out of their own area and look at where those interactions are between different disciplines um, and and that then enables and, and highlights some of those cross-cutting themes um, and and that's where that interdisciplinary um, approaches can come certainly from um, the institutional perspective as well but again it comes back down to understanding those opportunities within um, the plate that that specific place and closing that loop Thank you, Inga. I, I suppose that's that's your the interview answer, not your tech failing you. Uh, so I'm going to move on. Is there anyone else here who would like to chime in? Do raise your hand and I will do my best to spot you. Martin. Yeah, I just want to, well, I, I agree completely with Inga. I was uh, want to second that. But <clears throat> one thing that uh, I, I think is vital uh, at a university level is to sort of go beyond the conventional way of uh, operating a university uh, and have students uh, combine theory and practice um, at a very early stage. Um, we have been uh, running these experiments with some of our students um, where we had them um, pick a problem and then solve it. So some of them, for, as an example, uh, pick uh, food production and imports uh, because we're an island, we import everything. And, uh, you know, uh, if it gets spoiled, the food, you know, it's wrapped in plastic and bubble wrap and then all that kind of, and it, gets, it gets thrown out. And we're an island, we can't get rid of it. We have to burn it or, you know, uh, ship it back, <laughs> the plastic. So uh, some of them uh, actually uh, built uh, uh, an aquaponics uh, system, a functioning aquaponics system. And then they also built a functioning hydroponic system from trash. Just random garbage, you know, pipes, and you know, and, and they made it work, you know. And uh, you know, two of them went on to write master's dissertations on food production in in islands, and you know, so just trusting that that students are, are mature enough to sort of come up with their own solutions and engage, I think, uh, is is really beneficial. So that's something I would, you know, in, in regards to the question here, is just. Uh, the College of Atlantic does that really, really well, where they where they allow students to be mature, um, and they trust them, and they, they give them assignments. You know, they, they let them pick their own assignments and that kind of stuff. So I, I think that's the way forward 
uh, in terms of uh, you know, addressing sustainability issues. It's just having people engage with with uh, you know stuff outside of the university walls. And that's really useful. I do suppose some attendees are going to find that useful. Um, do let us know your feedback in the chat window and also, as James says, on the app. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question. I'm going to leave the energy question aside for a moment and draw your attention to the fact that we have another session on Orkney's energy revolution on Wednesday. So I'm going to come back to that if we do have time. But let's move on to Mark Jenkinson's question on tourism. Uh, most of the panelists by now have touched upon tourism. How do we ensure tourism is sustainable and also positively impacts local communities as well as the environment and ecology? I'm just going to leave you by saying um, Polar Research Policy Initiative, my think tank, is part of a consortium that works on a sustainable tourism development project in the Arctic context. Um, we have found remote Arctic communities often have very similar challenges to islands. Imagine if you are in a small community of Tukti Arctic on the northern coast, Arctic coast of Canada, and you have this big cruise ship that comes in with three times the population as your little community may have. It's very intimidating when your infrastructure and your hospital facilities and your roads are not built to cater to that big population. And one assumes sometimes, one argument is, but of course the cruise passengers would be paying in the local community. What we have found in these workshops is the economic benefit coming out of the cruise passengers stopping by is not always material. So, and it's not a negative thing, it's how do we, in that case, what models can we use to be constructive, to find a way to, to enhance the value economically, socially, culturally for both sides? So I'm going to leave, I'm going to see, I'm going to hand that over to James. Thank you, Duane. I think that's a really interesting concept and we've been challenged with this in Orkney for quite some time. And I went to a Smart Island conference a number of years ago. It's actually, you know, yeah, a few years ago and we were speaking about this. And um, one of the things that we've done in Orkney is we've had a port limit so last year or this summer we turned away more than 20 large cruise liners because we only have so many people we think can be accommodated within a particular time not just it's not just the money aspect we want to give people the very best experience but there's something beyond that as well we want to share both ways so you're, as you've said, we may come back to the energy issue, but a lot of the people in that kind of a leading edge technology would like to display that to these people because people come from all over the world. And we have people coming here that would never come before. And I have a very small cottage away on a particularly remote island, one of the most beautiful places in the world. And I chat to people as they walk past going to see the old man of Hoy. And I'm quite surprised at the number that came on a cruise ship and then decided, oh, we must go back because there's more there than it does justice on that taste of session from the cruise. But the challenge for everyone is to make sure you give the very best experience to the person who's visiting but you don't overload any particular place. So in Orkney, we're doing some specific things, you know, through technology, and we're seeking to get a, a much better coverage. We're looking at some 5G technology to cover things so that we can actually manage people in a sustainable way, also to give them the latest footprint they can on some of our World Heritage sites, but also to actually secure the best economic value from each of the trips back to the islands so that everybody gets a bit and everybody gets a bit because I believe that's the way that we are going to be able to move forward with a sustainable tourism policy. Thank you. Thank you for that, James. Alice, can I, can I invite you to make a few comments on this point? Duane, the first thing I would like to say is I think that when you take the long view of tourism from large cruise ships visiting tiny little communities, 
there's no getting away from just the sheer number imbalance of that equation. You have thousands of people coming on ships to communities which might number in the hundreds at most, at least on the Alaskan islands, in the Bering Sea and the North Canadian islands. So I would like to say that I think one of the things that we all who talk about the Arctic as a circumpolar region could do is to call more attention to the aviation companies developing sustainable airline fuel, be it electricity or hydrogen or biofuels, because it just seems logical that the answer for the long term is for aviation-based tourism to be encouraged over cruise ship-based tourism. And uh, it's just personally one of my goals to see if we could help that to happen in the places that are willing to be experiments for it. I could see, for example, that you could do a tour of the North Canadian islands or the Bering Sea islands in the same amount of time that you might be able to go a fraction of the distance on a cruise ship with 3,000 people on it. But if you're able to land on the land, you don't require a port that doesn't exist. You don't spoil the beaches when you have hundreds of zodiacs coming on shore and so forth. So I just would like to put that out there partially in answer to the question you all were discussing just before this about a role for universities. I think it's time to put some great minds to work on coming up with a tourism model for the Arctic that is not large cruise ship based. I know I'm going to encourage a lot of anger in the cruise ship industry for having said this, but I put it out there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alice. On that, on that note, you've actually allowed me to segue back to energy because one of our, uh, one of our um, attendees has asked, um, let, me, let me go to this, Casio Catus, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, and, and do you mention the transit of large commercial vessels through the northeastern sea route has been discarded by two large container companies, Hapagloy from Germany and CMA CGM from France, any oil spill would have terrible consequences in the Arctic waters. However, others argue the ships would use less fuel and consequently there would be less emissions for the northeastern sea route or going that route rather than the longer route to the Suez Canal, the Cape of Good Hope. Um, and so how would, what's your take on this? I would also, I would also uh, bring in the point about um, Again, James, the energy revolution in Orkney, both in terms of your flights and your ferries. So over to you, James. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we've got to prepare for a changing world and shipping is one of the tricky issues as far as uh, emissions are concerned. And uh, we do know that ships, like particularly the cruise liners being built at present are moving on to LNG we we'll probably find that happens away as, as again uh, with the with cargo ships. It may take a bit longer, but once you go to a gas-based uh, product, one of the things we're particularly interested in Orkney is to see where hydrogen comes in as a as a fuel, but also something that can be mixed in the transition with the LNG to lower that emissions. Also, there's no knocks or shocks. A, you know, a, a, a particulates that come off that fuel, which is a benefit, you know, as far as a, what a air quality is concerned. But th that's a long journey and we've got to start somewhere now. So I loved what Alice said about flying people everywhere. And that's another interesting space we're in now, particularly that we are producing hydrogen from renewable sources that people have come and said they would like to try some hydrogen flights from here. We also have another firm looking at battery operated flights for small hops. I think that's a really interesting Arctic issue to do some of these things. And again, there are other low carbon aviation fuels. But one of the things I've often felt with people experimenting on things 
is they very often try them in very different geographies or places in the world. So you don't have a proper comparison of how they really match against each other. So if we can offer a small test bed or a proving place where people can come with different technologies, we think that would be really helpful so that people can come and try it in one place. We did that with Wave and Tidal and we found that really useful because it's the same conditions that people, you can really see which are going to be the winners and which are going to be the things, the technologies that are worth pursuing. So th that's one of the Orkney pitches. Can we help the world? Because we are on a, on a time frame that needs you know, very fast intervention to make sure that we actually get the results through. So we've said, here we are, we're happy to work with anybody who wants to test these things. Thank you, thank you, James, that's really useful. You've got a few minutes left, so I'm gonna to jump to two questions. Number one, Patricia, over to you. I wonder, a question from one of our attendees, I wonder if that distrust and disaster governance remains the same amongst the community, the more they move away time-wise, from the disaster event itself. I repeat, I wonder if that distrust and disaster governance remains the same in the community, the more they move away time-wise from the disaster event itself. Right, um, I think this is a really good question and um, <laughs> equally difficult to answer because I think that there are quite a few factors involved in here and um, perhaps one theory maybe that might be useful is something from international relations called um, st strategic culture. Um, actually, before I get to that, perhaps first, I, I think first of all, it might depend on whether a person was personally involved or personally affected and how much by the disaster. And then extrapolating from that, the concept of strategic culture. So meaning um, what is the historical memory of a person, but especially a community, so a collective memory. And um, how does that permeate everyday life? Um, so that could be perhaps the experience of, you know, disasters over disasters over disasters happening and being disillusioned with formal disaster governance, um, or the opposite, we would hope. But um, the, an, an, an example that I would like to give, not island or not by, by our um, definition, but the um, country of Israel, for example, which I happen to be familiar with, you see this very, very clearly. So Israel or the Jewish people have um, a history of fundamentally distrusting authorities. And in today's Israel, you see that very, very much in when disasters happen, which they do in Israel, you have you know, floods and of course you have um, wars and so on. Um, because of that historical memory, and resulting in distrust, what you get is people flocking to a disaster to volunteer to help because they do not trust the formal disaster governance mechanisms to do their job right, even though they're actually quite good in that country, but there's just this distrust. So I think it would be a function of, amongst others at least, um, of the strategic culture of a country um, and personal, personal memory. I hope that answers it somewhat. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. We've got two minutes, so I'm going to do this very quick. Um, Sharon Yao asks, how did Scotland tackle the controversy over seaweed harvesting and the development of biofuel in the region? Would anyone like to go for this? Raise your hand. <laughs> right, okay, moving on. Um, Sharon, I think, I'm afraid, it's, we could a minute to go, so if you are attendees, do feel free to write, to write your questions in the Q&A here or get in touch with us through James, through the app or on Twitter. The Twitter handles are, hashtag, you know, I think Island Innovate. If you want to get in touch with us at Polar RPI, there's at Arctic Today from Alice Rogoff and James is at Orkney Islands Council and Martin at the University of Faroe Islands and Ingrid HIE. So on that note, Thank you ever so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, James, I'm going to hand this over back to you. I do hope all attendees here can join the session Orkney's Energy Revolution, I believe, on Wednesday. So thank you.